So good evening and welcome to the um, eighth uh, Barnett Oxenberg Lecture on Sino-American Relations. My name is Paul Liu, Chairman of the Organizing Committee, and uh, on behalf of the committee, I'll introduce the concept of lecture and place it within a context. So we're gathered here today to honor uh, the memory of A. Doak Barnett and Michael Oxenberg, uh, both American scholars and policymakers of distinction whose writings and actions had a direct impact on American policy toward China dating back to the 1960s. Uh, Doak Barnett was born and raised in Shanghai and is one of the few academic voices in the 1960s calling for a uh, direct relationship with China despite the deep differences between the two nations at that time. Doak's influence in American policy towards China was truly enormous. Business. Michael Oxenberg was a distinguished student of Doak Barnett and continued their intellectual line of thinking, eventually serving in the Carter administration's National Security Policy, uh, Council and playing a key role in the normalization of relations between our two great nations. Like Doak, Mike was an incredible teacher and a generous mentor. Both Doak and Mike straddled the world of academia and policymaking, nurturing students and scholars while providing valuable counsel to government and leaders. Both Doak and Mike shared a love of China's ancient culture and its people while not letting this affect their ability for critical and objective analysis and long-term vision. The bilateral relationship has matured well beyond its original geopolitical foundations into a deeper and broader relationship. Many of us here are deeply engaged uh, in this relationship in the fields of business, academia, and public service. It is also a relationship that has new challenges, tensions, and opportunities. The challenges and opportunities, ironically, are a direct function of the breadth and depth of our engagement. This is, what, this is what we are here to discuss tonight. The lecture is founded on the premise that in the midst of these challenges, a direct dialogue and an open airing of views between the US and China is extremely important. So today's, today's event is structured as a dialogue. Jeff Bader will speak on strategic cooperation between the US and China as an American, and Huang Ping will critique Mr. Bader's talk from a Chinese perspective. After that, the dialogue will continue with questions from the audience. We have chosen to have the lecture here in Shanghai uh, for its symbolism, for it was here in Shanghai that uh, President Nixon and Premier Tso Enlai uh, signed the seminal document in U.S.-China relations, the Shanghai Communique. And we sit here in Shanghai, China's premier business city and a commercial engine of the expanding relationship between our two great nations. So on behalf of the organizing committee, I want to thank the event sponsors for the generosity, Skadden Arps, Ernst & Young, Brown Foreman, Asia Media, APCO, and Coca-Cola. We also thank the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai and the talented team of event organizers under Jessica Wu. And thank you also to the Shanghai Association of American Studies for their partnership and cooperation. Finally, thank you all for coming tonight. Your engagement in the continuing dialogue between the US and China through your work and daily life does, and does have an impact. One of our past speakers, Robert Zellick, when he was at the State Department, articulated the concept of China as a, quote, responsible shareholder, a stakeholder in the international community. We are, in many ways, individual stakeholders in the relationship between China and the US. So let's continue to play this role responsibly. So thank you again for, and enjoy the lecture. Hello, everyone. I'm Jan Barris, and I've come from New York to represent my organization, the National Committee on US-China Relations, we're one of the two co-sponsors of this wonderful lecture. Uh, but we all owe a real debt of gratitude to Paul Leo, who is just speaking to you, because Paul is the actual uh, founder of this organization, it was of this annual event, and it was all his idea. He's a very, uh, he's a Chinese American, but he grew up with many Chinese values ingrained deeply in him because it was a very filial thought that he had to honor his two teachers. And so we've just been delighted at how this event is now in its eighth year. And we at the National Committee and our co-sponsor, the Shanghai Association of Asian Studies, uh, have been delighted to see the event grow to such a size and to have so many devoted followers. Um, I'm especially pleased today, those of you who've been here before, know that um, Doak Barnett's wife, his widow Jean Barnett, has come every year since the founding of this lecture series. 
And um, the year, uh, for the past couple years, another member of the Barnett family has come, James Barnett, who used to work, when he first started coming, he worked down in Hong Kong, and now he works up in Beijing. And I'm told that there is a third member of the Barnett family, who is in fact the fourth generation of Barnetts to work in China. The first generation was Doak's father, who came to Shanghai as a missionary in the early 1900s. Doak Barnett was born and raised here in Shanghai, and as I said now, his nephew, James, works in Beijing, and his uh, great-nephew, so Eugene Barnett's great-grandson, Chris Barnett, works up in Beijing as well. Is Chris here? Where are you, Chris, if you're here? Chris, please stand up so that people can see you. And James, you stand up too. So four generations of the Barnett family having worked in, in either Shanghai or Beijing. It's wonderful. Um, and I was going to go on a little bit more about Jean, but this year she asked if she could please say a few words. So rather than make her trudge up to the podium, Jean's just going to stand up here and share some thoughts with you that she'd like to make. Well, I thought that after being here for eight years, I really wanted to say something because uh, this is a, such a, a very fitting way to honor Mike and Doak. They love discussion, they loved argument, and I think we get all of those things here. Uh, I, as I said, I've been coming now for eight years, and I have every, I see familiar faces, and every, every year I see new faces as well. So I want to thank everybody for being here. I hope this will continue. I hope the dialogue will continue. And I want to thank all of the sponsors who make this possible. And I hope to see you all again next year. Thank you. What Jean just said, we hope to see all of you next year with your friends, and we hope we'll see all of our sponsors again next year. And now let me turn it over to Mr. Um, Dr. Huang Renwei, who is the chairman of the, from the wonderful Ding Lao Shir, Ding Xing Hao, who headed the association Stand Up Lao Ding for many, many years, and without whose help we could not have started this event. about 10 emails from Paul and Jane for this lecture for almost three months. <laughs> so how, many, uh, how much work they have done, uh, you can see. And uh, uh, this afternoon, uh, we are very honored to have our uh, very distinguished professor, uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Jeffrey Bader to as the uh, speaker uh, gave us uh, the lecture. And uh, Jeff uh, Bader, he served a long lifetime for diplomat folks on Asia affairs. And uh, he worked in State Department and the National Security Council and now in Brookings Institute. And uh, his uh, uh, marvelous career on China-U.S. relations, I think no one can compare him with uh, him uh, at that moment, and uh, he served twice as the senior director of Asia Affair, East Asia Affairs in National Security Council, and uh, he just republished the, the China's rise, China's peaceful rise, and Obama and China's peaceful rise. So this book is very, very new, uh, fresh new, and uh, I think today, uh, Ambassador Bader's uh, lecture will we'll give us very profound thinking and insight, uh, his uh, new elaborate uh, uh, thinking on China-U.S. relations. And many people always uh, put threat as the number one word of China-U.S. relations. Maybe U.S. believe China is threat and China believe U.S. is threat, but I think Ambassador Bader will give us totally different perspective on this. So now I should introduce Ambassador Bader as our honored speaker. Please. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Jan, uh, Paul, and Professor Huang, for the kind introduction. I'm always 
slightly uh, off guard, knowing know what to say when someone refers to me as distinguished. I've never thought of myself as distinguished. I think it just means I've been around a long time. But um, anyway, regardless, it's a great honor for me to be here following in the footsteps of a succession of outstanding diplomats and scholars in delivering the Barnett Oxenberg Lecture. Uh, they've been people, some my dear friends, with whom I've worked closely and from whom I've learned uh, a great deal. People like Stape Roy, Bob Zellick, Carla Hills, John Hunts have played in creating this event, which is becoming a major tradition in our relationship. Uh, special appreciation as well goes to Paul Leo, who more than anyone deserves credit for this event. In this name, it expresses the reverence we feel for two giants in the development of the modern relationship between the U.S. and China. Doug Barnett taught a generation of scholars and practitioners, not least the current Chinese ambassador to the United States, Sui Tian Kai. Doak was a man of great intellect, breadth, and insight, and of judgment, moderation, and great personal decency. As, as uh, Paul alluded to, he was one of a handful of brave souls who argued openly for a uh, uh, changed relationship between China and the United States in the 1960s. Uh, this at a time when it was politically incorrect and unpopular to do so. And he was a co-founder of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. I'm delighted that his wife and partner, Jean Barnett, has flown across the Pacific to be here with us today. It was a real pleasure to talk to Jean at lunch today. I also had the pleasure of getting to know Mike Oxenberg, first when he worked at the National Security Council under President Carter, and subsequently, after he returned to academic life, where he became a good friend, guide, and mentor to me as I developed my own interests in modern China. Mike, of course, played a key role in the normalization of relations between uh, China and the United States, and subsequently in forging links uh, between our two countries and societies. Doak and Mike were towering figures who helped build the bipartisan basis for a support for the relationship that has been so essential to its progress. In the last year, a new phrase has been used by leaders on both sides to describe the relationship of the United States and China, the one we should be building. President Xi uh, and who before him, and President Obama have referred to the importance of establishing a new type of great power relationship. This concept has not been particularly fleshed out on either side. As best I can discern, the thinking that lies behind the phrase is the realization that the history of the rise and of great powers has rarely been smooth or easy. The reaction of the dominant power to the rise of a newcomer frequently has been to see the rising power as a threat and for the newcomer to see the dominant power as an obstacle. Conflict, including life and death struggles, has often accompanied such developments. For example, Germany's rise in the late 19th century, Japan's rise somewhat later, uh, France's conquests propelled by a revolutionary ideology in the Napoleonic years, and the Soviet Union's rise in the 20th century. Some analysts have made a living out of warning of the inevitability of a similar clash between the United States and China. The objective of those who have articulated the desirability of a new type of great power relationship precisely to avoid such a clash between the US and China, so we should respect and appreciate their intent. My view is the one makes a mistake by overgeneralizing um, about such historic precedents. Theory matters, but facts matter too. Or as a Chinese statesman said, seek truth from facts. If the rising and existing power see their raison d'etre as being to establish 
or maintain dominance, then conflict is more likely. That was the case for one party or the other in the power transformations I've cited earlier. But history is contingent on decisions by leaders and peoples, not a set of Newtonian principles that tell us what will happen. The specific facts of the case also matter. One can't simply transplant a set of past events on present and future reality and have a rational basis for a prediction. That said, it would be a mistake to dismiss those warning of a descent into conflict between the US and China as chicken littles who say the sky is falling. If we study the history of US-China relations over the last quarter century, we see signs of the kind of dynamic that the pessimists warn us about. High levels of, of suspicion of the motives of the other, attribution of aggressive or sinister intentions, a belief on the Chinese side that the U.S. seeks to contain China, or worse. A belief on the American side that China seeks to supplant the U.S. and corrode its global influence. There are numerous manifestations of these trends. For an insightful study of the mutually degenerating perceptions, you may want to take a look at the essay published by leading scholars Kenneth Lieberthal, and Wang Ji Su, addressing US-China distrust, which postulates an atmosphere of rising mutual distrust that will end badly if there are not significant course corrections. Wang Ji Su, a very distinguished scholar whom I greatly respect, describes a series of beliefs he calls widespread on the Chinese side about US intentions. For example, he says, quote, American politicians are true believers of the law of the jungle, and their promotion of democracy and human rights are in reality policy tools to achieve goals of power politics. This cynicism is so widespread that no one would openly affirm that the Americans truly believe in what they say about human rights concerns, end quote. Or, quote, the US has sinister designs to sabotage the communist leadership and turn China into its vassal state. Such alleged designs are referred to as America's strategy of peaceful evolution against socialism. U.S. sympathies toward and support for anti-communist demonstrations in Eastern Europe before the collapse of the Soviet bloc, the color revolutions in the, for, uh, in the former Soviet states and the Arab Spring in 2011, and support for reforms in Myanmar are all manifestations of U.S. schemes to this effect, end quote. Such views frankly seem surreal to most Americans. On the other side, there are elements in the U.S. political, economic, and military hierarchy who regularly interpret Chinese actions in ways rife with suspicion and negative presumptions, which many of my colleagues and I work hard to refute. So what can be the elements of a new type of great power relationship that does not lead to conflict? There are at least four broad dimensions of the U.S.-China relationship that provide major opportunities for cooperation or conflict. They are, first, bilateral economic relations and competition in third country markets. Arguably, this is the factor in the relationship that is most salient in our domestic politics, the one that most affects short-term attitudes. Second, international issues of interest to all countries on which the U.S. and China have disproportionate influence because of their power, such as climate change, cyber intrusions, coordination of fiscal and monetary policies of major economic actors, counterterrorism, nonproliferation, global economic security, disease control, and foreign aid. Third, political and security competition in the Asia-Pacific area as Chinese military power expands and as the U.S. rebalances its capabilities to the area. And fourth, seeking solutions to conflicts, civil disorder, rogue behavior, or instability in third countries around the world, so-called hotspots. I believe the U.S. and China need to work creatively and persistently to solve problems in all four of these areas. 
Within each category, there are issues that are hugely consequential for the United States, and the outcomes will be notably better or worse, depending on the degree to which China and the United States are on the same page. Uh, indeed, I'm tempted to say that the relationship will only be as durable as the weakest link. Uh, if, for example, we descend into an arms race and military confrontation in the Asia-Pacific, obviously whatever other areas we cooperate on will be overshadowed. Similarly, if our economic relationship is seen as unbalanced or unfavorable to one side or the other, one should not expect cooperation on other matters to save the relationship from tissue damage. That said, we have very bright and capable people, outside and inside the government, working on all these issues. And to acknowledge that they are daunting is not to suggest they are unsolvable. I propose today to concentrate on the last of these areas, namely whether the U.S. and China can work together to resolve conflicts and dangerous situations in the rest of the world. We work closely with our allies on many such issues, having the potential to endanger international peace and stability. If we can do so with China, that will tell us something important about the long-term compatibility of our international objectives. It will also determine, in many cases, whether these problems can be solved. In the 1950s and 60s, when the U.S. and China viewed each other as irreconcilable ideological foes, the two sides also fought actual or proxy wars in many third world sites. The Korean War was the most obvious and costly. In Vietnam, the U.S. intervened massively to prevent a communist takeover, and China provided substantial assistance, military, political, and economic, to Hanoi. Elsewhere in the world, China did what it could to support revolutionaries and their movements in, for example, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. China saw wars of national liberation as movements for justice, as well as useful instruments to decrease U.S. influence around the globe. The United States and China first came together when Nixon was president and Mao was chairman because of shared hostility to the ambitions of the Soviet Union. This common view about the major geopolitical view foe we face led us to find overlap, though not always identity in our policy towards many of these so-called hotspots plaguing the world at that time. The Shanghai communique named a number of them. Vietnam, Korea, India, Pakistan, hostility, and Taiwan. The last, of course, a special and distinct case. At the time of Nixon's visit, the two sides were still far apart on all of these issues, but the ensuing years led to a narrowing of difference and determined management of those that remained. In the succeeding years, so long as the Soviet Union remained the principal foe of each of us, cooperation or parallel action begun by Nixon and Mao grew to the point where many referred to uh, an unofficial alliance. The two countries worked in parallel to thwart Soviet objectives and Soviet proxies in Afghanistan, Cambodia, and Angola. China's position on Korea shifted from support of Pyongyang, Pyongyang's effort to unify the peninsula by force to one of support for stability culminating in Deng Xiaoping's decision to recognize South Korea over Pyongyang's objection. In Afghanistan, the two countries co uh, cooperated covertly to support the resistance. Both of us opposed deployments of Cuban troops to Africa under Soviet sponsorship. In Cambodia, we supported the coalition led by Prince Sihanouk, resisting Vietnamese occupation, albeit in different ways. China moved away from support for extremists in the Arab world toward the more balanced position between Israel and the Arabs. When top U.S. and Chinese officials met in the 1980s, strategic cooperation on these developing world crises was prominent on the agenda. The underlying understanding was that our interests were parallel to prevent expansion of Soviet influence and to prevent instability that might hurt our interests. In most, though not all cases, the U.S. interests and influence in such areas exceeded China's. So in the broad interest of the U.S.-China relationship, which brought huge benefits to China, 
Beijing would defer to the U.S. policy objectives, which they didn't necessarily feel they had a huge stake in, which, but which they understand that we did. If China could not determine outcomes and didn't greatly care about them, Beijing judged that deference to U.S. preferences was acceptable. Such issues remain at the top of the U.S.-China agenda today. When Presidents Obama and Hu Jintao met during the time when I was at the National Security Council, more than half the time in virtually every meeting was consumed by Iran and North Korea. At times, Afghanistan and Sudan were the subject of considerable discussion. More recently, Libya and Syria have crowded into the agenda. How do our countries look at such issues today? Do we have similar perspectives, uh, or are differences much greater? Before discussing the particularities of individual cases, it's worth trying to understand how the U.S. and China generally think about areas of crisis, conflict, or instability in which they themselves are not directly involved. First, the United States. Since World War II, the United States has viewed itself and been viewed by others as the chief stabilizer or balancer of the international system, the enforcer that responds to aggression or conflict that threaten to destabilize regions or upset global norms. Our judgments have not always been sound, but the sense of responsibility for the orderly, orderly operation of the international system has been a common denominator of successive American administrations. Part of the burden of being a great power is accepting that responsibility for this systemic regional and world order is a national interest. Examples have been marshalling of resistance to Saddam Hussein in 1990 and to Serbian attacks in Bosnia and Kosovo in the 1990s. The U.S. long has sought to advance the cause of democracy and protection of human rights and has been a leading proponent of the responsibility to protect vulnerable populations against tyranny or civil war. Since the end of the Cold War, such advocacy has impelled us into Libya, Somalia, and Haiti. It has pushed us into diplomatic, though not military, engagement to encourage democratic outcomes in Central Asia during the period of the so-called color revolutions and into the Arab world in response to the Arab Spring, which doesn't feel so much like spring anymore. It was the driving force behind U.S. efforts to isolate Khartoum in response to genocide in Darfur. It also has underlain our insistence that countries broken by conflicts such as Cambodia, Angola, Afghanistan, Iraq, Bosnia, South Sudan, and Kosovo could only be reconstructed on the basis of a democratic process. But at the same time, there have been limits on U.S. action to advance democracy and human rights. It is hard to think of a single instance where the U.S. in fact has introduced military force for the primary purpose of creating a democratic system. And as the costs of the Iraq war have become clear, that experience persuaded most Americans, if they needed such persuading, that democracy should not be imposed through the barrel of a gun. A clear present example of a case where the U.S. has resisted urging of some to introduce military force to encourage a democratic solution uh, is Syria for the last two years. There are, of course, numerous other instances where highly repressive or military governments have imposed their will on their population, and the U.S. has not considered military intervention, such as Zimbabwe, Pakistan at various stages, Myanmar until its recent reforms, and uh, the Taliban regime in Afghanistan before September 11, 2001. Other motives have consistently played a much larger role in driving U.S. intervention decisions. The issue that has driven the U.S. to its most vigorous intervention in third country issues in the last two decades has been proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and their acquisition, real or potential, by Saddam Hussein's Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. 
This issue has brought together America's principal international security concerns. Efforts to acquire nuclear rep weapons by dictatorial or repressive governments with a history of aggressive acts or threats against their neighbors, periodic support of terrorism, and hostility to peace regimes and friends or allies of the U.S. American policy has included a mixture of isolation, unilateral and multilateral sanctions, and military actions or warnings. How does China see the same landscape of issues? As Chinese remind us, they see the period from 1839 to 1949 as a time of national humiliation, in which China was overwhelmed by imperialism, foreign occupation, and civil war. The memory of that period, hardened by a, a uh, narrowly nationalist and ideological version of history that obscures the complexity of China's interactions with the outside world during the Qing Dynasty, and somewhat obscured by recent achievements, has bred into China a hostility to foreign intervention, a deep-seated suspicion of Western justifications for military action, and commitment to the notion that national sovereignty is the bedrock principle of international affairs. This view stems from a concern that China's sovereignty might be violated in the name of some international principle. But it is not merely a self-defense doctrine. It underlies China's approach to international issues generally and makes it extremely reluctant to intervene in issues like Syria and Libya that are or were primarily civil wars. China accepts that it bears a responsibility for maintenance of international peace and stability as a permanent member of the UN Security Council. But outside of that, it does not assert or justify a particular role in maintenance of global stability. More broadly, it has been reluctant to take on global responsibilities and defense of the international system as a national interest. It describes its armed forces as a means to protect China's sovereignty, not an instrument to enforce stability. It does not subscribe to an ideology that it wishes to spread through force or other means. It does not see itself as a bastion of international norms that need its military strength to defend. China has little experience with war in the last five decades. Only a conflict with India in 1962 some small-scale skirmishes with the Soviet Union in 1969, a brief but bloody war with Vietnam in 1979, and a number of small-scale incidents with rival claimants in the South China Sea. All were along its actual land or claimed maritime borders. So China does not have recent experience projecting power overseas. Accordingly, China has not seen maintenance of stability far from its shores or encouragement of positive change as a useful or practical objective of national doctrine or power. It is an equal opportunity trading country, caring little for the political orientation of its partners, and having a high threshold of tolerance for repression or dysfunctionality. It has sought to acquire energy and mineral resources overseas to feed its rapid industrial growth. And in doing so, it has, in some instances, invested in countries that were international pariahs, such as Zimbabwe, Sudan, and Iran. China consistently rejects attempts by the international community and the US to criticize and affect the poor human rights records of countries targeted by the West. It does so out of multiple motives including its devotion to national sovereignty, its ideological rejection of the universality of democratic values as we understand them, and an anxiety that international scrutiny can turn to China. Finally, China does not consider that it has substantial stakes in many places in the world, certainly not to the extent that the US does. China regards activities in many parts of the world as tangential to its vital interests and certainly not requiring an active engagement to affect outcomes. Rather, the Chinese view, consistent with their modesty over their potential impact in faraway places, 
is that, it, is that they can live with whatever the outcome may be in most cases and should not assume responsibility for affecting it. China feels differently about Asia-Pacific security issues, which it believes impinge directly on its national security. If we just look at the contrast and world view I've described, one will not be surprised that on many of the key international issues, the US and Chinese perspective is different, sometimes radically so. For example, on issues like Syria, Darfur, and Zimbabwe, China does not share the US and Western view that the international community needs, needed to take exceptional measures <laughs> interfering with the sovereignty of national governments to protect the population. In Libya, China resented the decision by the Western allies to utilize a UN Security Council resolution designed to protect the population of Benghazi as a tool to overthrow Gaddafi. China vetoed US-sponsored resolutions on Myanmar during the Bush administration, refusing to accept the argument that Myanmar's internal situation constituted a threat to international peace and security and not wanting to see a friendly neighboring government destabilized. As I suggested earlier, there are other issues, however, on which China has quietly gone along with US policy, not because of support or fundamental agreement, but because China understood the issue was seen as a vital interest by Washington. The obvious examples are the wars in Iran, in Iraq and Afghanistan which China did not support, but which it also did not oppose with anything like the single-mindedness with which, for example, Russia, France, and Germany opposed US intervention in Iraq. In such cases, Beijing has decided that the value and health of its ties to the US are more important than whatever benefit they might gain from distancing themselves from US policy. Uh, I have been describing enduring features in the US and Chinese worldviews that have often led us to different conclusions. But the world situation in which our views are formed is dynamic, not static. So, for example, the PRC initially approached the Arab Spring with a certain uh, complacency about its potential impact on Chinese interests in the region, relying on traditional notions that China should align itself with sovereign governments facing unrest, and it would not be held accountable for the outcome. In fact, in Libya, Chinese interests suffered when Gaddafi was ousted and the new government considered Beijing unfriendly because of armed transactions with the outgoing regime. This was a new experience for China to be considered by foreign nationals a significant factor in a domestic situation far from its borders and to pay consequences for poor policy choices. This is not a, situation, a new situation for the United States. We have often paid that price. Uh, this has led Chinese experts to argue that China needs to pay much greater attention to developments in the region and not merely assume that friendship with capitals is a sufficient basis for a successful policy. The world also is changing in places where China traditionally did not play a role, but that are now targets of interest for China. For example, China imported more crude oil than the United States did from the Persian Gulf in January 2013. This is a startling turnaround from a half century of US reliance on the Persian Gulf and Chinese detachment. It does not mean that all of a sudden China will assume responsibility for, for security in the Persian Gulf. It does not have the capability to do so. But it does mean that it will care much more in the coming years about what is going on in the region and about developments that could affect the free flow of oil. I think also, it is also safe to predict that Chinese influence relative to the U.S. will grow in Afghanistan in the years to come as the U.S. withdraws the last of its combat troops and China's proximity and interest in a Muslim state bordering Xinjiang province assert itself. Our disagreements over democracy promotion can often be muted when dealing with specific cases. There is a strong international consensus demonstrated repeatedly in the last two decades that the resolution of internal conflicts, civil wars, and disintegration of states requires an election process and reconciliation among competing parties 
supervised by the international community through the UN Security Council. This is how the war in Cambodia ended in the, uh, with Chinese support in the 1990s. Similarly, conflicts in Angola, Namibia, Afghanistan, Nicaragua, Bosnia, Kosovo, South Sudan, and East Timor were all brought to a close by UN or multilateral mediation culminating in elections. China was involved in supporting many of these outcomes and did not resist any. China understands that legitimacy in such countries requires an electoral process, even if China itself does not have a syst such a system and otherwise rejects uni unilateral democracy promotion as subversion. A few words on the big ones, Iran and North Korea. The most important hotspot issues we face at present are Iran and North Korea. While U.S. and Chinese policy each reflects some of the perspectives I've described, in fact, at the same time, they demonstrate our ability to work past such differences and to find common interests. In Iran, despite China's view that in principle Iran has the right to produce enriched uranium for a safeguarded nuclear power program, it has been clear that uh, it does not accept Iranian attempts to become a nuclear weapon state. It has supported UN Security, Resolution, Security Council resolutions that have put in place unprecedented draconian sanctions on Iran in the last four years. It has worked with the permanent five plus one countries in presenting a united front to Iran in negotiating a return to compliance with the IAEA. It has quietly gone along with U.S. requests to avoid expanding its energy investments in Iran as other countries have pulled out. The U.S. has reciprocated by waiving sanctions against Chinese companies whose actions could bring them into conflict with provisions of U.S. law. Why does cooperation work in Iran, albeit within limits? China genuinely does not wish to see a new nuclear weapon state, both because of the impact on stability in the Persian Gulf, but also because of the potential impact on the global non-proliferation regime, in which China has become a stakeholder. If Iran, and for that matter, North Korea, should become nuclear powers, what will be the impact on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, and the attitude of China's neighbors, such as Japan and South Korea, uh, towards that treaty? This gives China pause. We have argued, and China agrees, that Iran, uh, a country that has called for Israel to be wiped out from the face of the earth, and which has destabilized many of its neighbors, uh, that if it acquires nuclear weapons, then China's quest for energy security will suffer a grave setback. China also highly values its relationship with Saudi Arabia, which has made clear to Beijing that Chinese actions to strengthen Iran are contra contrary to Riyadh's interests and will draw a reaction. Finally, Beijing understands that Israel's restraint depends upon its belief that the international community, including China, are imposing costs on Tehran. The result is that the U.S. and China do not see exactly eye to eye on the Iran strategy, but have enough common interests so there is more, more cooperation than competition. North Korea presents a different set of variables, but the outcome is somewhat similar. Beyond the nuclear issue, where we share a strong interest in eliminating the North's program and preventing proliferation, North Korea, as China's neighbor, is much more of a vital interest to China than to the United States. Above all, Beijing values stability on its border with North Korea. It does not desire either stability or North Korean collapse that could lead uh, to violent reunification and a U.S. ally on its border. But at the same time, it holds the North Korean regime in disdain. Pyongyang's provocations have led to military responses by the U.S., South Korea, and Japan lately that affect China's own security. Beijing is no more pleased with loose talk about nuclear war in its border than are the U.S. and its allies. 
Traditionally, China has tried to maintain a balance in its relations between North Korea and the US. It dragoons North Korea into six-party talks and was instrumental in forcing concessions from Pyongyang in an earlier period. It has condemned Pyongyang's nuclear missile tests and supported sanctions by the UN in response. It has warned North Korea against provocations, particularly at a time of acute tension in late 2010 after North Korea shelled a South Korean island. On the other hand, Beijing has sought to limit sanctions to avoid pushing Pyongyang into a corner, potentially precipitating either a backlash or chaos or both, and has declined to use its leverage in energy and food supplies to induce behavior change. This long-standing balancing act may be changing. Chinese disgust over Kim Jong-un's antics in the last few months has been unmistakable and manifested publicly. The most obvious step was the decision by the Bank of China to close the accounts of North Korean Trading Bank. The Chinese leadership does not have confidence in the new team in Pyongyang, Pyongyang to maintain the peace and fears that its cherished goal of stability is under assault, not from the US and its allies, but from Pyongyang. This creates an opportunity for the US and China to work more closely and effectively on an issue of vital concern to both of us. I'm on balance optimistic about the prospects for US PRC strategic cooperation. In recent visits to China by Secretary Kerry and General Dempsey, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, it was clear that the Chinese government welcomes more intensive dialogue on North Korea. They also discussed Iran and Afghanistan. Intensive discussions are not the same as cooperation, but they're a necessary preliminary. From the American perspective, we not only welcome, but frequently need Chinese cooperation. The Obama administration was criticized for saying this in 2009, as if by acknowledging a self-evident truth, it was somehow surrendering leverage. So I'll say it again, and I welcome a debate with critics who think that a cool distance between our two sides serves our interests better. We need to understand that already China has substantial interests in many hotspots, and its influence and views can affect behavior and outcomes. But more important, in the future, that influence will only grow. If the U.S. adopts an attitude that traditional power arrangements ensure that we will be able to continue in the future to dictate outcomes, we are in for disappointments, surprises, and setbacks. Many Chinese analysts understand that China needs to step up constructive involvement in such issues. Chinese interests around the world, commercial and otherwise, are growing rapidly and China cannot complacently assume that instability in faraway places will not affect it. To reduce the complexities I've been discussing to basics, the most important factors in determining whether we can cooperate will be, number one, the particular facts of each situation and each country's perception of its national interests. That might dictate cooperation in some interests and not in others. Number two, how much each side, particularly the Chinese, care about the particular situation. When they don't care, to deference to US views is their default position, but such cases are likely to diminish in the future since Chinese interests are becoming global. And three, the overall state of the US-China relationship. If Chinese leaders see ulterior motives behind US policies in general, as Wang Jisoo has told us they do, then there will be serious obstacles to cooperation on particular cases, even if our interests in such matters are relatively aligned. I believe a sound US-China relationship is arguably the most important foundation of peace, stability, and prosperity in the 21st century. Cooperation on strategic issues will make that more likely, or the absence of cooperation will undermine it. None of us in this room can much affect the realities on the ground in these areas of conflict and instability, sad to say. But we can affect the way opinion leaders in our countries think about the role of the other in coping with such problems. 
I don't whitewash and I don't want you to whitewash behavior by either side that undermines peace and stability. We, we need to be clear-eyed about American and Chinese conduct. But for those of us who seek to understand the perspectives of the other side, I hope we will all make a greater effort in combating pernicious notions about each other rather than merely presenting them as if they were unyielding realities and in building the bridges of cooperation, not ceding the field to those who want to tear them down. I thank you all for your patience, and I look forward to your comments, criticisms, and questions. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> thank you, Chief. I really enjoyed this lecture. I think all of you the same as me. And uh, we have our honored commentator, uh, Dr. Huang Ping. And uh, Huang Ping is director of Institute of American Studies in Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. He got his PhD degree from London School of Political and Economy. And uh, he worked in many international organizations before he became the director in American Studies Institute. And uh, here, uh, we welcome Huang Ping as commentator, please. Thank you, Professor Huang Renwei, and also Professor Ding Xinhao. It is really my great honor, even greater than I can really bear, to be the commentator, the critics to Mr. Jeffrey Bader's very enlightening speech this very well-known uh, lecture called, launched and organized by the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and the Shanghai Association for American Studies. Um, it is greater honor because, uh, as I said, greater than I should bear. Is when uh, Jeffrey began, began his service to U.S. foreign policy and diplomacy in 1975, if I'm not wrong. Both Renwei and I were still working in the countryside as members of the Sending Down generation. And I also understood that Professor Deng Xinhao and Professor Li were all not fully returned to the university yet. And from that time, Onwards, during 40 years, uh, Jeffrey has either worked for the U.S. government, either State Department or National Security Council, or at the well known Brookings Institute. And in recent years, from late President George W. Bush to President Obama period, he, when he was uh, in the Again, either Brookings or the government, he had uh, such a wonderful interactions with us uh, in a very frank uh, manner to discuss those issues as he listed today. Uh, and my comment will be very short. Uh, before I get into those say, questions, uh, I would uh, share very much many of his uh, ideas, points, and those issues he listed in his uh, speech. And in the end of his wonderful speech, he said, if Chinese leaders see such motives behind the US policy in general, as Wang Jis has told us they do, then there will be serious obstacles to cooperation on those very particular issues. And uh, my understanding, uh, at least Chinese leaders, leadership, since from Hu Jintao to Xi Jinping, actually from Teng Xiaoping, since Teng Xiaoping, Chan Min and nowadays, um, has already, always, always tried from our side the best to 
established kind of a collaborative and cooperation uh, partnership with main powers in general and the U.S. in particular. I should perhaps also uh, give you a s small story, but uh, when my academy, which was uh, in name of Chinese Academy of Social Science, was actually younger than the Shanghai Academy, we were a part of the Chinese Academy of Sciences until 1977. Uh, we became uh, separate from that academy. Uh, that was Deng Xiaoping's idea, as well as uh, for his opening and reform. And my niece also is an uh, immediate consequence of his uh, visit to the U.S. So 1978, when Professor Oxenberg was already working for the U.S. government, um, my academy for the whole year, 1978, had a one sort of so-called foreign negativity or exchange negativity. That was Deng Xiaoping had a meeting with a delegation headed by Professor Oxenberg. Uh, in those years, there were not many uh, such exchanges between the two sides, and so the academy played the role to organize such meeting. Um, so since then, until now, I would, I would say the relationship is actually gradually getting more and more matured. Of course, more and more uh, complicated. Um, so nowadays, when the both has uh, originally from the Chinese side, now I think both sides and agree the there should be such a new type of power relations between US and China. So how to turn this uh, idea um, or from an idea to a concept to something really substantial, therefore we can really work on and implement those into different sort of layers where China and the US can work together, bilateral, regional, and global. Very traditional security issues to non-traditional issues, global issues as well. Um, so my question first, and I agree with Mr. Jeff Bader, those strategic and important issues where China and U.S. definitely can potentially work together, uh, in spite of whatever differences we may have. But my question is, uh, in those years when China and U.S. just established such kind of semi-alliance, uh, or strategic relations since Nixon and more. Now without Soviet Union, without such sort of big common threat, uh, where is the foundation for this very strategic and new type of power relations? Those issues in North Korea, in Iran, in Syria, etc., uh, etc., et which something you did not mention, uh, like uh, the disputes over the Aoyu Islands between Jan Japan and China and some other such type of disputes between China and uh, some Southeast Asian countries. Uh, are they solid enough for us to establish such new type of power relations in order to have a very peaceful, stable 21st century? So this is my, uh, so I strongly believe there can be such uh, collaborative or cooperation and uh, positive relationship and new type of power relations. And from Chinese side, uh, first we feel we are still at a very early stage for a market an economy. And we still belong to the developing societies or countries. And therefore, we, we will definitely still need for our interests, you know, peace and development strategy with the U.S. and also with other great powers, including the great powers around us, Japan, India, and Russia, etc. Um, but how really to avoid uh, possible crisis 
conflicts, even sometimes because of tiny issues or third needs countries. So this is the second. Uh, in spite of such possible uh, collaboration or strategic uh, new type of big power relations, uh, how to avoid those tiny problems? They seem tiny, but they can be such a, so to, in terms of consequences, disastrous causes. Second, both China and U.S., we have uh, sort of real sort of domestic problems, constraints. Uh, even we are at a different level. China, we, I can list many, all of us know. And U.S. also has seen so many uh, constraints from within, economic, social, political. So there can be easily, for both countries, uh, a kind of change to a very sort of inward looking. Therefore, in order to have a more collaborative and cooperation in regional global challenges, problems, how to actually really achieve such kind of shared global responsibilities for the world peace and the world order. Thirdly, I would say something to do with this, too, but uh, actually the world is, is sort of running away from us. It's getting more and more globalized, kind of globalizing transnational than uh, sort of uh, the framework within the nation state. Even China and U.S. plus many others are still the major players and uh, we don't have a real sort of global system to handle such globalizing world. We only have international system based on the nation state. And China and the U.S. as the biggest, plus some others, Japan, India, and Europe, biggest nation states, how we can cope with such world which is running away from us. I remember when we had the 10th anniversary of the September 11th, which was co-organized by U.S. Uh, National Intelligence Council with the British. Uh, I was one of the participants. And the second day we had uh, some sessions. One was uh, called Global Governance. And it turned out in that session, there was no U.S. nor Chinese participants. So we said it's perhaps too difficult and even too early to talk about global governance, which is something we really need. So I like to, uh, when I shared and enjoyed so much from Jeff Bader's enlightenment speech, I like to perhaps uh, discuss this with you and also share these concerns with my very distinguished uh, respected scholars and audience here. And finally, I would suggest, in spite of whatever differences, uh, very different approaches to those challenges, problems, uh, concerns, we perhaps could uh, think of if we really want to establish such a new type of power relation and avoid whatever mistrust and even I shared with your comments, you talked very um, politely, that uh, it's not a good uh, an approach to show what kind of mistrust uh, we have had, but rather to identify something where we may have shared interests or con strategic concerns, where we may overlapingly uh, had, on the one hand, difficulties. Uh, therefore, on the other hand, we may turn those difficulties into opportunities, even with some perhaps necessary ambiguity. But we can go further. Uh, for instance, climate change. This kind of yeah, real needs to all of us, and it's not caused by any particular uh, group country or organization, but this is, is the 
such a serious challenge. Uh, and those challenges uh, Chief Bader has listed in his speech. I thank you. Thank you very much. I think many of you will raise questions. Please try who will be the first one. Okay, you first. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Bader, I'm Jean-Marc Blanchard, Bai Yonghui from Shanghai Jiaotong University. Thank you for your very interesting remarks. Um, I'd like you to talk about a hot issue that hasn't been one for many years, which is the Taiwan issue. How do you see that going forward affecting the prospects for Sino-US cooperation? Uh, the second quick question is, you mentioned that uh, some Chinese suspicions of the United States seem surreal, and I agree with that. Um, but there's been hundreds of meetings, colloquiums, seminars, dialogues, gatherings over the years uh, geared towards dispelling those suspicions. Why don't those go away? Thanks. Okay. Um, I think Taiwan is a good news story. I think the way in which the leadership in Beijing and Taipei have handled the issue in the last five years has um, diffused, diffused tensions and frictions to the lowest point in, in memory. Uh, essentially, uh, Ma Ying Zhou has uh, accepted the notion that, um, uh, that the, the two sides agree there is one China, but they each have different definitions. Uh, and that has provided confidence that Beijing needs uh, not to worry about secession, okay? And so, uh, you know, I mean, when I lived in Beijing back in the 1980s, it was not so easy to get from Taipei to Beijing. Uh, and also, I will say, it felt like going from a first world country to a third world country when you went from Taipei to Beijing. And now, you fly directly um, about 500 flights a week between Taipei and the mainland and you no longer feel like you're going from a first world country to a third world country. You feel like you're going from one place of Chinese civilization to another uh, in, with a fairly similar standard of living. Um, the future, I don't know. I, I, I think that the last five years have provided a model for how the two sides can handle uh, their differences and expand cooperation that's tremendously meaningful to people on both sides. I think there's a lot more that can be done in the people-to-people -people trade and investment side. On the political side, clearly Taiwan still wants to go slow. Um, and the PRC officials that I've spoken to understand that, and they say that they will respect um, the wishes of the people of uh, Taiwan in that respect and will not, not push unduly. So, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I think I've been a diplomat for most of my career, you realize you don't solve very many problems. What you do is you manage a lot of problems and you kick some problems down the road. Um, this is a classic manage and kick down the road. Uh, as Deng Xiaoping said about China, Chinese maritime disputes, uh, they will have to await a generation that is smarter than us. And um, as one Chinese diplomat said to me recently, we don't think that we're smarter than Deng Xiaoping, so I guess we've got to wait a little bit longer. And Taiwan strikes me as that kind of an issue. Um, you know, point about suspicions and distrust. You know, I am not a great believer in endlessly banging the drum of strategic mistrust and talking about incessantly why can't we trust each other more? I, I think that the notion that the US and China, given their stature, their position, their influence in the world, the notion that one day they're gonna wake up, people on both sides and wake up and say, I was wrong, I trust them. Uh, to me, it's ridiculous. Uh, what we can aspire to is, I think, is strate not strategic trust, but strategic transparency so that we each understand what the other is doing and what their objections are, objectives are, uh, and strategic confidence, that we have confidence in 
what the other side is, the, is going to do. Strategic trust, um, I, I, I will avoid making another remark about my two distinguished friends, Dr. Lieberthal and Wang Ji Su, but uh, I'd rather, uh, I'll, let them, I'll let them solve that problem, I'll solve lesser problems. Okay, second question. I think Professor Huang Ping has already mentioned uh, something about the uh, uh, Japanese territorial disputes with China on the Diaoyu Island. So it seems to me um, that in the Asia Pacific region there are many political challenges to Sino US relations, and one of them is the uh, Diaoyu Island dispute. So um, do you think uh, the China US relations in this region will be affected by that factor a lot? Thank you. Uh, upset when we were involved in it in 2010 when there was an uh, episode between Chinese fishing vessels and Japanese Coast Guard vessels that resulted in the arrest of a Chinese captain it's being held for some time before he was released. Um, obviously, the situation that has arisen since Japan, the Japanese government purchased the islands last summer is a more serious one. Uh, I, it concerns me, okay? I think, I, I mean, you can look at it on several levels. On one level, uh, it is frankly absurd that two countries with ties as extensive as Japan and China, the second and third largest economies in the world, now are holding their relationship hostage to four uninhabited and uninhabitable rocks in the East China Sea. That is, if you step back, if you were a visitor from a foreign planet and you walked into the middle of this, you'd say, I don't understand this. This is ridiculous, okay? That is sort of one perspective to keep in mind. It's not, I understand that's not the only perspective, but that is one. Um, and, uh, but I do understand that many countries in Asia, China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam and Indonesia, among them, are experiencing rising nationalism, rising nationalist sentiments. This is not a situation unique in China. And when you get this kind of rising nationalist sentiment, it makes it very difficult to be flexible and to compromise on issues of sovereignty uh, of this kind, the way China did in the 1980s and 1990s in solving its land disputes. I, I think this is a problem that all the leaders in the region face. I mean, look, I, you know, I'm a huge admirer of former President Yu Myung Bak. I uh, just good friends. But what he was doing, getting on a helicopter and flying out to Dokdo Takashima Island, I don't understand that. I mean, it clearly had to do with national sentiments at home. Um, and what we're seeing in the uh, Jiaoyu Islands uh, is similar. I personally, and I've said this to my Japanese friends, I thought the decision by Tokyo to buy the islands was a mistake. I, I said that at the time. Um, I have said publicly that the latest visits to Yasukuni by 150 members of parliament and the deputy prime minister were foolish, counterproductive, a pandering to domestic opinion and ignoring Japan's strategic interests. Okay, that's my view and I've been public about that. Um, they have a public opinion just as China does uh, and it frankly distresses me to see the degree to which opinion has dug in on both sides. I think the most important thing now is for both sides to understand that neither one is gonna persuade the other that about its sovereignty. Uh, therefore, we need to calm down. Uh, we have too many ships and too many planes uh, in a very small area, uh, none of whom want to get in combat with each other, but anyone can make a mistake. And suddenly, if you have a situation where a Japanese or a Chinese ship fired on another and you have loss of life, uh, that would be very bad. The reaction in both countries uh, would be, let's say, strong. Um, I've said to friends in China and Japan, it's different than China and Vietnam. 
China and Vietnam have been having these fishing disputes for centuries, and they've kind of figured out how to deal with them. China and Japan is different. So uh, yeah, I worry about it. Um, I know the source of your question, the source of your question is the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty in Article 5 of the Security Treaty, which uh, makes clear that the U.S. security commitment to Japan extends to all areas administered by Japan. And, and that includes uh, what they call the Senkakus, and it's called the Jerry Islands here. We can't weaken our security treaty with Japan to do so would have all manner of unwelcome effects uh, for the whole region. Uh, so that's not something we can walk away from. But the last thing in the world the U.S. wants is to see tension between China and Japan. Uh, and for us to be making unwelcome choices between two countries that are profoundly important to the United States. Okay. The third question to this corner, you. Please try yourself yeah. first. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Wu Xuetang from Shanghai University of International Business and Economics. Uh, my question is to uh, Ambassador uh, Jeffrey Bader. Uh, I have a question about that new type of great power relations, the China-U.S. relations. As you mentioned, I agree with you that when you talk about China, his China-U.S. history in the 1960s, uh, it's, uh, uh, when, when China and, it, and President Nixon visited China and signed the joint, joint communique in Shanghai, that the new con I, I think it's a new type of uh, great power relations because we have to share the global view of, uh, of our common interest, that both sides take the vital interest of each other okay. into consideration. Now we are entering the same periods. Now there's the same situation. Do you think uh, we can share the similar view that uh, we, uh, uh, China and the United States, share the view the globally, and we t also take the vital interest of each other uh, around the Chinese neighbor? Uh, for example, in the East China Sea or uh, South China Sea, when the U.S. is taking the uh, strategic offensive posture, uh, when China cannot understand and cannot accept it and cannot work with the United States globally. Do you think that it's going on or the United States can change that kind of posture? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure. The U.S. has treaty alliances uh, in the region. We have a treaty alliance with Japan. We have a treaty commitment to South Korea. And we have um, uh, certain obligations under the Taiwan Relations Act. Um, these are obligations that fall close to China's border. Okay? Uh, unless the United States is going to rescind any of those three um, sets of commitments, uh, the United States can't afford to pull back to Hawaii or to San Diego. Um, you know, my colleagues from PACOM, when they would come out here, would get questions about U.S. preparations for war and contingency plans that we see in the newspapers all the time. And I mean, look, let's be honest. This is what this is what militaries do. Militaries plan for contingencies. They plan for possible military conflicts. That is why we pay them and why we have them. Um, China's do the same. We all don't leak as much as we do, so we don't get to read in the Chinese press your contingency plans, and then we get to read ours. Um, I, so I don't foresee a situation where the U.S. Uh, vanishes uh, from the Western Pacific. Uh, I do think you're raising a fair question uh, about the size of our footprint, the size of our maritime footprint, um, our long-term basing presence. And these are going to be subjects of, I think, intensive discussions in the U.S. And we have a sequester going on right now uh, on the military budget. Um, uh, you know, uh, a particular level of presence is not fixed for eternity. I think these things are going to be discussed. Um, but, but the U.S. presence uh, will remain. Uh, you know, I, 
In the book I wrote, I talked about the, quote, rebalancing. Um, and me, what the rebalancing was, was a response, in part, it was a response to countries in the region. They wanted to see an enduring U.S. presence. Uh, there was an unease about whether the U.S. was here to stay. Um, and what the rebalance has been about has been to suggest that we are here to stay. Uh, Thank you. And I'm Merck. Sorry. Introduce yourself. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, um, last name Yang, and from, um, from, a, from, a, from, a, from a NYU. I just had a question. Um, uh, uh, well, oh, sorry. Uh, this, this country, well, China now sends the most number of students to the uh, United States. And American universities from, you know, from, uh, from NYU to Duke University and some others are planning to establish campuses here. And so my question is, uh, what role do you think these um, cross-national flows of people and ideas have on the relationship? Uh, of the U.S.-China relationship is the, the millions of people that go back and forth between our countries and who are involved in trade and investment and the people-to-people -people and cultural relationship. I, mean, I, I used to speak to American audiences a few years ago as literature was rising in the U.S. about China's rise and anti-Americanism and hostility and then I frequently said, you know, I lived in China for some years and have visited many times, and in all of my visits, I have never once, never once encountered anti-Americanism in China, never once. Now, of course, I read the Global Times once in a while, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm talking about in my, personal, in my personal experience, and that is because when Chinese people and American people encounter each other, they naturally get along, okay? And, uh, and it's, you know, say, our, our politicians and our other elite leaders who are constantly talking about uh, inevitable conflict and ordinary people uh, who do not. And we do not think that way, Frank. Um, I, uh, I think that they, you know, the real foundation of our relationship is you know, these student exchanges, these cultural exchanges, tourists going back and forth, businessmen investing in the two countries, uh, uh, the university, the, the massive university exchanges. In my opinion, so long as these continue to develop, um, then leaders, uh, leaders will have to hesitate before they head down a more, a more, more hostile road. So I, I, you know, I'm a huge believer in these programs. I think that they, uh, they affect ordinary people, and ordinary people have a way of affecting their leaders. Okay, last question. Last question. Do you want to watch? Um, I'm from Shanghai Jiao Tong University, formerly professor uh, at Cornell University, so I'm both indeed. And I also appreciate both our speaker and our commentators. Huang Ping, I really appreciate your comments as well. This is a question for both of you. In fact, our young speaker already has raised it partially. How then culture can play a role in a strategic consideration, articulation, and the mutual understanding between the two countries? Culture, particularly humanistic guided and laden, value laden kind of studies of cross cultural matters. Thank you. Thank you. The foundation for U.S.-China, but also I think for China and other countries' relationship, either to deal with those very strategic challenges or to establish a long-term uh, cooperation, collaborative partnership. And culture, my understanding, is not narrowly arts, professional arts especially, but actually the people-to-people -people exchanges in terms of their 
uh, way of living, way of thinking, way of communicating each other. Uh, very ordinary people, students, business, etc. And also by such exchanges, uh, I, you can again identify some or possibilities of shared interests, shared values, and kind of a mutual reciprocal uh, knowledge. Uh, not only for your own interests, but of course for our interests for each, but also for a much larger, longer term peace development and order. And the culture, of course, such will take much longer time. We need patience. And also, it's not uh, as obvious as those events, policies, and very official statements. Uh, but actually, these are the roots. Uh, so very happily, as we can all of us can recall from the early time, from the early 70s to now, during the four, more than four decades, you could see how much actually have been uh, achieved. And this stability should uh, not only be continued, but it's strengthened. And I think the Chinese and the US governments, uh, since Obama and Hu Jintao, both have recognized this. So therefore, apart from economic strategic dialogues, we have now the high level people to people exchange programs. And within which hopefully from the US side, there could be as many as 100,000 students will come to China and more Chinese also will go to the US. And only amongst the younger generations. Uh, so this is a, a uh, very sort of positive uh, possibility to go beyond whatever uh, mistrust or problems and this kind of a new type of power relations or uh, to avoid conflict problems and zero-sum games is the, and the people who can actually easier or easily uh, uh, get along each other. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> People relations, the people. What people learn from them is that other people are not so different from them. That people everywhere have a lot more in common. They're all really different. They have the same aspirations, the same you know, loves and hates, and the same same things they want out of their lives. And through these. This cultural context, they develop an affinity with people from other cultures. And at the same time, they see things that are different, uh, and they come to respect those if they approach it in the right way. They hear sort of rational and sensible explanations from other people about why they do things differently. Uh, and that, in turn, should make them more tolerant. It doesn't always work that way, but in most cases, it does. Okay, so uh, we should end our uh, express our great thankness to our sponsors. Uh, that you, those are Scandon, Ernst Young, Brown Foreman, APCO Asia Media, Coca Cola, and uh, the most important is American Chamber Commons in Shanghai, and uh, my own institute. S-A-A-S. <laughs> and uh, also we should say great thankness to Shanghai American, uh, uh, Shanghai Consulate General in Shanghai uh, and the uh, Consul General of uh, Robert Griffiths here, please. And uh, also, I express my appreciate my uh, thankness to Jim Barnett, and uh, you always contribute so much and uh, fly from Washington to Shanghai, and uh, yes, you you really give us spiritual support. 
and uh, we should uh, uh, express again our great thankness to Paul, Liu, and uh, Jim Barris, who did so, who have done so much uh, for this lecture. Almost ten, almost eight years. Uh, okay, eight years. And also, we should give out our thankness to the interpret there. So, give. So, finally, give our thankness to uh, our speaker and the commentator, please.